without further ado, I think I'm going to start because I'd like you to reflect on your own life when you follow this lecture. Okay, so the title of my lecture is Chicago, Barcelona, Shanghai, The Transformative Powers of Language. And the first section is In the Beginning. I tumbled into motherhood unexpectedly at the age of 42. I had no specific expectations of what being a parent would be like. Little faith in any innate maternal instincts or talents and absolutely no clear plans about how I was going to form the life of another human being. No one can prepare you for the moment when you bring another person into the world. Some aspects are similar to stories you have read or been told, but other parts are completely different. I was prepared for a red, slimy baby, <laughs> but the jet black hair was a surprise. When the doctor handed me a crying little boy that I'd only seen in ultrasounds, I was completely unprepared for the ferocity of a mother's love. I wanted to protect him, to let him know he was safe, and to comfort him. In the hope that my voice would somehow soothe him to accept that he was now part of this universe, I made the most important promise I will ever make to him. I didn't promise to be a perfect parent, because there are no perfect parents, just as there are no perfect children. I didn't promise him that I would always be there, because the world is full of unexpected accidents, diseases, and misfortunes. What I did promise him was a promise I knew I could keep. Don't cry, because the world is a beautiful place, and I promise that I will show you how wonderful the world is. I kept whispering my promise into his ears, knowing he could not understand me, but even so, it was important to seal the promise. It was the best and biggest gift I could give him. Nevertheless, as a parent in a post-9-11 world, it was an unusual, and some would say naive and foolish promise. When we turn on the news, the world is far from beautiful and wonderful. There are wars, famines, and atrocities, too numerous and gruesome to keep up with on a daily basis. Innocent people are caught up in waves of disaster, both natural and man-made. Diseases like malaria and AIDS claim thousands of lives a year. Wars and conflicts are scattered around the globe. The forces of violence, death, and instability seem poised to invade our peaceful corner of existence and to disrupt the world that we have carved out for ourselves. All it takes is one armed individual to change our lives forever. Yet in spite of this fact, in spite of the wars, famines, earthquakes, and terrorist threats, one fact remains. If you ask for help, someone in the world will make an effort to help you in some way. For example, I have traveled extensively and gotten lost or off the beaten track on several occasions. And do you know what? Every single time, a stranger saw my confused look, stopped, and sent me in the right direction. I was just talking to my husband earlier today. I said, remember when we were in the south of France? They canceled our hotel reservation. We're sitting on a corner of the street with our suitcases. And a taxi driver came and picked us up, said, I'm French, but I lived in Canada. You're lost. I'll find you a hotel. OK? So those things happen. <laughs> Technically speaking, we as individuals are not under an obligation to help the lost, to educate the ignorant, to right the wrongs we see. But we do so countless times, often without being asked or recognized for completing the task. It is that individual effort on our part that keeps the wars and famines and earthquakes from overwhelming us. But having this conviction, this faith that we have within us, the power to offset the ne negative effects of so much suffering, is not a belief we are born with. Our life experience is a powerful agent in allowing us to embrace a vision of the world that contradicts the constant messages of violence, corruption, and doom we see on the news. How we see the world, in other words, is directly connected to how we experience the world. And we make sense of these experiences through language. 
Language gives the experiences shape, meaning, and memory. We come into this world without language. Listen to it for months and months before uttering the sounds that become words and dedicate a significant portion of our waking hours to developing our ability to, to communicate through sounds and written squiggles on paper. We use language every day, but how often do we think about how language transforms us? Without language, would thought be possible? Would we be able to remember anything? Would we even be able to live as we do without language? All of us have the experience of learning one language, our native tongue. But how do our lives change when we learn a second or third or fourth language? If one language creates our individual identity, do more languages expand our lives, give us new facets to our personality, and add dimensions to how we experience this planet Earth? All these questions lead me to the main topic of my talk, Chicago, Barcelona, Shanghai, the transformative powers of language. And the first step, of course, is Chicago. Everyone has their own personal Chicago. It's the place where we take our first steps, learn our first words, and begin to see ourselves as part of a world beyond the garden fence. In my personal experience, this place was a suburb of Chicago most of you have never heard of unless you've gotten a speeding ticket in Stone Park. <laughs> but more than a place, it is also a place in time that no longer exists. I grew up when Melrose Park and Stone Park were still very Italian. It was not unusual for children to speak Italian at home, eat only Italian food, and to have parents whose English was heavily accented or non-existent. A classic example was my school janitor, Giulio. While he was able to sing Italian opera arias to rival anything heard at La Scala in Milan, his approach to English conversation was to substitute Italian whenever he did not know the English word. Since Giulio's knowledge of English was very limited, most of what he said was incomprehensible to anyone who did not speak Italian. For 12 years, I heard my grandfather say, I met Giulio on my walk today. He seemed very happy, but I have no idea what he said. My grandfather considered Giulio a friend, but their friendship consisted of 20 years of not being able to understand each other. Like many of my schoolmates, I spoke one language at home and another at school because my parents were recent immigrants. Unlike my schoolmates, however, my parents did not immigrate from Bari, Italy. So our home language was German. My mother was born in Nuremberg, Germany, and came over in the 60s. My father was born in a small town in the Carpathian Mountains that was Hungary at the time, but is now part of the Ukraine. Interestingly enough, my mother grew up monolingual and did not learn English until her 20s. But my father grew up in a place of ever-changing political and linguistic borders. In his small town, most inhabitants spoke at least two, if not four or six languages, albeit at different levels of competency. Being ethnic Germans, my grandparents spoke German, even though their ancestors had left Germany at least 200 years earlier to settle in the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Even though German was spoken at home, my grandfather preferred Hungarian because he had received all his schooling in Hungarian. Outside of the home, Hungarian was the official language, but many people spoke Ukrainian or White Russian. Add to that the proximity of Romania and Czechoslovakia, as well as the use of Yiddish and Hebrew, and you have a venerable linguistic stew in a very small town. While I grew up in an environment closer to the multilingual crossroads of my father's world, rather than the monolingual bubble of my mother's, it was my mother who did the most to promote language learning at home. She insisted on speaking to me in German, buying books in the German neighborhood in Lincoln Square, and taking me to see German language films when they played at the Davis Theater. She enrolled me in German school on Saturdays <laughs> so that I would learn the basics of grammar and improve my reading. 
She also went with me every Saturday on the bus to the Lake Street Ellen Oak Park, then to change for the Ravenswood train. It took over an hour each way, and we did it for years. In our current climate of tiger mothers and helicopter parents, what my mother did does not seem all that unusual. But in the late 60s and early 70s, my mother was going against every prevalent idea about how children learn languages. At the time, it was believed that learning two languages at once would delay language acquisition as well as overall learning. <laughs> Bilingual children were doomed to lives of academic failure. They would learn slower than their peers and never catch up. They would not be able to participate in regular classrooms and would therefore languish in challenging academic environments. And most important of all, they would never learn any language properly because they would confuse them. More recent linguistic and neurological studies contradict these myths, as well as many others. In fact, bilingual and multilingual children create brain pathways that are different from their monolingual peers. As a result, they display more varied approaches to problem solving, do well in school, and have advantages when learning more languages. My mother, however, did not have that kind of academic back backup to support what she was doing. Two of her German-speaking friends were adamant about raising their children English only, even though it would mean that they could not communicate with relatives in Germany. Things got so bad at one point that a friend and neighbor refused to speak to my mother because she spoke German <coughs> to me. The only justification my mother could make to the critics was that the royal families of Europe grew up multilingual and somehow managed. <laughs> Until I began kindergarten at age five, my world was very small. I stayed at home with my mother and saw my father early in the evening, uh, early in the morning, in the evenings, and on weekends. My paternal grandparents lived upstairs, so I visited them daily. There were neighborhood children to play with, but it was not unusual for families to move, so I had several friends that lasted only a year or so. In other words, the home dominated my experience, and at home we spoke exclusively German. Only when we went outside, to the grocery store, to the bank, to play, did English become necessary. English came into our house, however, when we got a television set, shortly after my third birthday. It was a small, black and white set, and because I didn't go to school yet, the television initially went in my room. <laughs> Even though we were not the type of household that had a t the TV on at all the time, I remember <laughs> watching the monkeys in scooby dooby doo while getting dressed in the morning. I adored both. So I was happy, happily puttering around in my little bilingual pond when at age three, my mother decided to visit her parents in Germany for an extended time. My father went too, but work only allowed a visit of several weeks for him. My mother and I stayed for four months. In those four months, I completely forgot any English I had learned. I was completely fluent in German and only in German because that's all I heard for those months when I was a toddler. When we returned to Stone Park, I had to learn English again. But my parents were not worried. They assumed that I would relearn it quickly, and I did. By the time I began kindergarten, there was no difference between my English and that of my cousins who had grown, grown up monolingual, their parents' choice. It was not until the age of eight that I visited Germany again. My grandfather was dying of cancer, and it was a very difficult time for everyone. I do not think that my language skills or learning were high on the priority list of anyone at the time. I made some friends in Germany, but never very many. German became a domestic language and remained so for much of my life. It is that domestic, it is that domestic aspect of a language that makes the Chicago stage. We learn language at home, and it defines what home and family mean to us. What we speak at home is not the same as what we speak outside the home. Outside the home, there are transactions, bills to pay, and errands to be run. There is shopping and visiting. We communicate with people who are not our family. But in the home, language transforms into something different. Home language is intimate because it links us to those human beings who are closest to us. For that reason, home language is personal. 
we make up words and modify structures to suit us. There are words and expressions that are only meaningful because we share space in the home. Home language does not always follow grammatical rules because it doesn't have to. It is the language of emotion, be it love or anger, because we feel more intensely at home. We can be who we really are before we have to put on the armor of our public selves and venture out into the real world. In German, there is a word strongly associated with home, gemütlich. It is often translated as cozy, but the translation only captures a part of that meaning. A place that is considered gemütlich is cozy, but when our home is gemütlich, it means that we feel secure, whole, and protected. At home, we feel comfortable in our own skin. We are cocooned from the demands of the outside world, and we are allowed to be vulnerable. Gemütlich means we feel at ease, are satisfied, comfortable, and comforted. We have a base from which we can recover when the demands of the outside world have become too much. Gemütlich means we have nothing more to prove, so we can rest, reflect, and just envelope ourselves in the softness and comfort of home. We can return momentarily to our first language, the language of childhood, of home, of family. We connect again with that original language that we learned piece by piece from our family center and renew our relationship with our former selves, who we were before we ventured forth in the wide world. Okay, and then now we get to Barcelona, the second stage. Eventually, we do leave home. We go to school, expand our circle of friends and acquaintances, and develop lives that we lead outside of home. Our personal Chicago is still there, but it ceases to be our only world. We begin to create other lives based on decisions we make as we grow up. Sometimes the most casual decision happens to be the one that has the longest lasting effect, proof that we cannot and should not plan everything. I chose Spanish as my foreign language in high school because it was a practical and sensible thing to do at the time. The Italian immigrant neighborhood was un undergoing rapid change. A large influx of Cubans in the 1970s and then Mexicans and Puerto Ricans altered the dynamics of the place. Spanish seemed to be the language of the future and so seemed the most obvious choice. My incursion into Spanish, however, was a very different experience from learning a language at home. The setting was the classroom, the focus on grammar, and there was little chance to practice. Basically, we students sat there and listened to grammar explanations in English, attempted to conjugate verbs correctly on quizzes and exams, and then subsequently listened to explanations of how and why we had gotten it wrong. Does this, I hope this is not sounding familiar. It was the era of fill in the blank for vocabulary and grammar, so there was little opportunity to create sentences. Very occasionally, we were expected to create dialogues, and we failed miserably because it was so easy to resort to English. As you can imagine, <coughs> it was not very conducive to creating fluent speakers and writers, but it was the methodology in use. Curiously enough, Spanish in college was not that radically different. Grammar was still the center of everything. Although our professors encouraged us to speak the target language, frequent bouts of incomprehension from us made them resort to English. We read a lot of literature from Spain and listened to lectures, but there was little pressure to make us produce the language. Clearly, if I was going to achieve some level of fluency, I needed to go abroad. Unlike today, very few students did a junior year abroad in the 1980s. In fact, in those days, it was quite common that teachers of Spanish never had set foot in a Spanish-speaking country. Most foreign language majors did not study abroad, and while there were several viable programs, the choices were paltry compared to the offerings of today. Since I wanted to teach and I wanted to be fluent, a junior year abroad seemed the way to go. I chose Barcelona because the city seemed cosmopolitan and exciting. I was lucky that I made such a choice. Barcelona in 1987 and 1988 when I lived there 
was a very different city than today. To begin with, most of the world hadn't discovered what a fascinating place it is. As a port city on the Mediterranean, it has a gritty, disreputable charm that coexists with high fashion and opulent mansions. It possesses the most intriguing street in the world, Las Ramblas, where high society matrons commingle with sailors and prostitutes in a bizarre tapestry that is that city. To be young, virtually penniless, and in Barcelona was and is akin to Hemingway's movable feast. In one of those gifts that fate sends us from time to time, I was fortunate to make a valuable friendship with another student in my program. Like me, Bridget was committed to improving her Spanish during her year in Barcelona. Early on, she suggested that we speak to each other exclusively in Spanish, come what may, to force ourselves to make the leap into fluency. I confess there were times when I really wanted to lapse into English, but Bridget was firm. After a few weeks, speaking only in Spanish became more natural as we acquired the vocabulary to talk about the things we wanted to talk about. The rest of the study abroad group, 70 students from universities in Illinois and California, regarded us as slightly demented. There was a level of incredulity when others discovered how insistent we were on Spani speaking Spanish, but when Bridget's friends joined us for coffee or to see a movie, they soon discovered that we meant it. Given the time we were spending together exploring the city and attending classes, in addition to speaking Spanish at home with our host families, we noticed great improvements in fluency and vocabulary. We got the hang of doing everyday things in Spanish, buying bread at the bakery, shopping in the market, dealing with bank tellers. We began to get our bearings in the city too. I lived in a very interesting neighborhood, Gracia, of narrow streets and small plazas. Bridget lived near Antonio Gaudí's Parque Güey. I am not sure how long and how well we would have progressed on our own in this way. Fate again threw us another fortunate coincidence. We met Pilar in October when the regular university semester began at the Universitat de Barcelona. Since Pilar had been an au pair in London, she was sympathetic and supportive of our language goals. She helped us out, explaining customs and practices that we had observed but not understood. She included us in a, her circle of friends and made great efforts to introduce us to unknown parts of Barcelona and Catalonia. She became our traveling companion and friend. We were an inseparable trio for that year. There is a curious transformation that goes with learning a language that no one really talks about, even though everyone experiences it. We develop a different personality in the other language. That is not to say that we acquire a Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde personality split. Rather, we begin to take on cultural attitudes and even biases of our adopted language, which in turn influences how we are in that language. This interior change does not necessarily play itself out in our other language personalities. Instead, it is as if we develop alternative versions of ourselves. Our essence remains the same, but the degree of a certain personality traits is amplified or reduced. We may be more outgoing and talkative in the, the other language, or we may be more reflective and less daring in our additional persona. Both Bridget and I noticed this kind of change and spoke about it. Initially, as Bridget observed, there was almost a childlike quality to our Spanish personalities. For example, when we could finally understand jokes in Spanish. We laughed louder and longer than we would have out of sheer happiness that we had actually understood the punchline, <laughs> not because the joke was any good. Eventually, after months and months, we evolved as people and lost the more infantile aspects of our personalities. Nevertheless, we weren't exactly the same people we had been before. Learning another language had transformed us not just increased our knowledge and understanding, but had made us into different people. We, in essence, had acquired a second, and in my case, third persona. We were living two lives within one existence. This transformative aspect of language learning is for me the most important, despite the fact that it is the least discussed. Advocates of learning another language always stress its usefulness. You can communicate with more people, 
uh, be more competitive on the job market, and weather economic downturns more successfully than monolingual peers. Of course, all these facts are true and highly practical, but they hardly constitute a convincing argument to get a 12-year-old to commit to several years of intensive language study. What if we recast our rationale to embra embrace the personal and idealistic rather than the merely practical? What if we told you that learning another language, and I mean really learning it, to the point that it is an integral part of your daily life, will transform your life into one that is fuller, as well as more meaningful and fulfilling than the one you already have? Wouldn't you commit to living it a 3D instead of a 2D life? Devoting yourself to another language means that you live more than one existence, have a wider and more diverse circle of friends, and relate to the world in a multitude of ways. Being bilingual or multilingual means eating a banana split every day, while everyone around you is destined to try only one flavor their entire lives. As a testament to the way one choice can lead to many outcomes, my year in Barcelona practically determined the course of the rest of my adult life. I returned with a very high level of fluency and competency in Spanish, decided to pursue graduate student studies in Spanish, switched from Spanish literature to Latin American literature, met my husband in graduate school, and eventually completed my doctorate at the University of Illinois. I traveled and lived in many foreign countries. I returned to Barcelona for a year, spent summers in Paris and Brazil, traveled extensively in Central America, Argentina, Uruguay, Colombia, and recently Chile. I have met fascinating people along the way, people I would have never met had I not studied Spanish and gone to Barcelona my junior year abroad. I have interviewed writers involved in the Sandinista Revolution in Nicaragua, worked on research projects dealing with race and gender in Latin American literature, and participated in conferences on three continents. I have traveled by plane, train, bus, horse, and dugout canoe. I have been invited to receptions at five-star hotels, to a Kuna Indian woman's hut where I was offered roasted bananas, and to a cockfight in a Colombian town populated by the descendants of ex-slaves. I have expanded my circle of friends, gained a Costa Rican mother and sister, and been welcomed in countless homes as a guest. Because people have opened their houses to me, I have tried to return these acts of hospitality in the knowledge that any traveler who crosses my threshold will in turn invite another traveler into their home. There are too many people and places to mention here, but the main point is that one choice during my own personal Barcelona unfolded into so many varied and unexpected experiences. Each one was valuable and important. Many led to other unanticipated adventures. Yes, choosing a language led to a career, but it also made a life. One I could never have imagined when viewing the world from my personal Chicago. All of you, regardless of age, are at the Barcelona stage. While some of the choices you make now will have long-term effects, such as your career, whom you marry, where you decide to live, there is a lot you cannot and should not try to control. Doors do open. Opportunities surface. The impossible becomes feasible. The new and the foreign may appear strange and incomprehensible, but they should not be approached with fear. Rather, view these shifts as part of your ever-expanding universe, as the meanderings of your own personal Barcelona road. And now we come to the third section, Shanghai. While it may seem like a long way off for you now, Eventually, you will come to your personal Shanghai. During your Barcelona phase, you will be making important professional and personal decisions that will have a strong impact on the kind of life you will lead. Nevertheless, there comes a time in your life when you need a Shanghai. Among my unrealized dreams when I turned 40 was that I never learned to ride a horse, fence, or speak Chinese. As soon as I got tenure, I decided to do something about these unrealized dreams. I signed up for horseback riding lessons. Do you know one of the most surprising aspects of learning to ride a horse? The fact that almost all your attention is on reading what the horse is thinking and feeling. In other words, your brain can only partially be worried about what you're doing. 
You need to gauge the horse's mood, state of anxiety or fear, as well as personal quirks. Ignoring these details can be deadly. As my riding teacher said, it's a one-ton animal that's letting him or her ride on its back. Okay. Learning to ride, then, is very similar to learning another language because it focuses on understanding how another being communicates with you. Horseback riding was physically and mentally challenging, but endlessly fascinating. More so was the second undertaking, finally taking the plunge into Chinese. By this time, I was hardly a novice at language learning. I spoke English, German, and Spanish well. I had studied Portuguese, French, and Catalan, and had varying degrees of proficiency in each. Chinese would be a challenge because it bore no relationship to either a Germanic or Romance language. Chinese makes you use parts of your brain that you did not know you had. As you struggle with making sense of characters and pinyin representations of the written word, you try to connect both with sounds and meaning. And this is where I get to this slide, okay? Um, this was a challenge, okay? It, those of you who study Chinese, ni hao is just hello, okay? But the way you end up studying it is you have the letters you recognize, which are the pinyin, and that gives you the sense of the sound, okay? So if you see ni hao and can say ni hao, you've got the sound. And if you can remember the meaning, you connect it sound and meaning, so you got some of it. But then you have to go on the left and you have to get the characters. So then if you look at it, you've got to connect the characters with meaning and sound as well. Okay? I always told my, uh, my, my Chinese instructor, I usually get two out of three. I either got pinyin and meaning or meaning and characters, but it was seldom to get all three of them. You know? And you're constantly trying to connect them. So this, this, this was definitely something new for me. During my Chinese 101 class, I could actually feel the cerebral muscles straining to take it in. I was challenged. My whole notion of the written word was being reformed because Chinese depends on characters rather than a letter alphabet. Just that one characteristic made it essential to memorize so much more just to be able to form simple sentences and expressions. Add to the fact that the strokes in the characters must go in a certain order if they are to be written out properly, and you begin to understand why the study of Chinese as a foreign language is akin to signing up for 40 years. Along the way, however, there were intriguing discoveries. Do you know that the expression long time no see is a literal, literal translation of Chinese? Or that another greeting asks you whether you have eaten? If you think about it, it makes perfect sense. Chances are, if you haven't eaten, you will not be in the best of moods. <laughs> other experiences began to clarify other points. Before beginning Chinese 101, I had met a policewoman from China who was doing a four-month exchange on our campus. As I met some of the other students from the exchange group, I was astounded at the accuracy of their memory. One man remembered me months later, even though he had only seen me talking to Xia at Anderson Pool for a few seconds. Xia herself could recall details of activities she did with my family with astounding clarity. Clearly, the Chinese language rewires the brain to work harder. Many adult language learners accept the theory that after a certain age, usually 12, no one can acquire a foreign language to the level of a native speaker. In my experience, that is not entirely true. I didn't begin Spanish until the age of 14, but by 21 I sounded almost native-like, and two years later, native speakers assumed I was from Spain. A French TA who studied with me at the U of I had a similar experience in French. He began in high school, and by the time he was in, gra in the graduate program, no one doubted that he had spoken French all of his life. One of my classmates at the U of I speaks Argentine Spanish so well that he is taken for Argentinian all the time, even though he was born in Kansas and didn't begin Spanish until high school. My father, who didn't begin to learn English until well into his 20s, has no discernible German, aspect in Eng uh, German accent in English, a feat almost unheard of for a German speaker. Of course, compared to millions of adult learners, these are the exceptions rather than the rule. 
However, I stand by my belief that it is very important to avoid the assumption that when you undertake the study of a foreign language as an adult, you will not achieve a high degree of fluency and competency. If you accept this negative thinking, you create your own psychological block that will keep you from attaining the level of proficiency you might achieve otherwise. A valid comparison would be an, the adult who learns to play the piano. Obviously, he or she will not become a concert pianist. After all, how many of us do, even if we begin as children? But an adult musician can learn to play very well and derive much satisfaction from the experience. In the same way, an adult language learner can achieve near-native fluency and accuracy in a foreign language, even though the learning processes and experiences are different from a child's. <coughs> As a language learner who has learned languages in different contexts, at home, in the classroom, and in the real world, I think I can offer an alternative consideration about why it takes adult learners more time and effort. Our lives change so much when we grow up. During childhood, learning to speak and later write and read takes up a major portion of our waking hours. In fact, as children, Learning how to do things is our first priority. As everyone grows older, learning begins to become crowded out by other obligations. We work and have responsibilities at home. Emergencies crop up and we are the go-to people who deal with them. In other words, the distractions of daily life and adult responsibility keep us from making language learning a primary focus. We learn languages, if we learn them at all in adulthood, on the periphery of our lives, and sometimes for limited purposes, to pick up a few useful phrases for a trip, to welcome a foreign colleague at work, to take up an interesting hobby. That is just reality. It does not mean that we lack the potential to be outstanding in the language we are struggling to incorporate in our lives. My personal Shanghai has yet to be accomplished. Due to professional and personal demands, I have taken Chinese 102 three times and have never completed it. <laughs> Unlike in decades past, I am not a model student. I miss class, turn in homework late, and do not come to class prepared. <laughs> Those of us who have taken class with me are really laughing at that one, I'm sure. My Chinese instructor, Lan Hui, has been a model of understanding. But even with these setbacks, I still have a goal. I want to spend a summer abroad in Shanghai, ideally when my son is five years old, so I can introduce him to Chinese and we can embark on this new adventure together. He will have clear advantages over me in one respect. There are sounds in Chinese that are so close to each other that they sound almost the same. A child can distinguish them much better than an adult. It's a hearing issue. Other than that detail, however, there is nothing to keep me from being at least competent in Chinese, although I have accepted that this project will take me much longer. However, I will stick to my plan. Therefore, during the fall, I intend to sit through some Chinese 101 classes to refresh my memory, and I will sign up for Chinese 102 again in the spring, and this time I will pass the class. <laughs> there are exciting changes happening in China and I want to witness them firsthand. I don't know what my Chinese persona will be like, but I'm curious to find out. In contrast to when I was 20, I know that other pathways will unfold, so I'm less concerned of what they will actually be. I'm excited at the prospect that they exist, and it lo no longer matters that they will be this way or that way. It is important to have a personal Shanghai in life a challenge that is different from our previous professional goals and accomplishments. A learning task that perhaps we may never excel in the same way we excelled in other endeavors, but something that pushes the boundaries of what we know to enter in the territory of what we don't know. Once we cease to have a Shanghai, we cease to grow, to discover, to explore. We live less fully than we can because we cut ourselves off from creating those other personas that are our lives lived in multiple dimensions. This concluding point brings me to the beginning of my talk and to the promise I made to my son. The world is indeed an endlessly fascinating place, 
full of places and people to discover. At 13 months, his first word was hi to a waitress in Georgetown. So I think I'm accomplishing what I set out to do to, to, for him, to see the world as a place of potential friends. While his language pathway is different because he's taking on English, Spanish, and German, my son is really only one of a long line of students. I have spent 23 years teaching others how to communicate in another language. In a sense, I have been practicing my promise for many years before my son was born because it was the underlying principle to what I was doing as an educator. Whether you see new places as foreign or familiar and other people as enemies or friends depends largely on how you have shaped your personal Chicago, Barcelona, and Shanghai. At this point in your lives, many of you are creating Barcelonas and you will be introduced to many unanticipated detours and adventures because of the decisions you make to create them. Nevertheless, in your future, there still shimmers the prospect of Shanghai. The opportunity to start again, to renew yourself, and to create another you <coughs> that is entirely of your own making. As I conclude this last lecture, I hope I have given you a new way of reflecting on your life, but most of all, I want to end with the prospect of that Shanghai. It awaits you just beyond the horizon that looks like an end, but is just another beginning.